just a quick reminder that in our last podcasts, we discussed monitoring, and now we're into the third step, decision making. The monitoring phase of the process creates or updates the risk register and leads to an evaluation of particular issues and threats. However, based on the categorization and good judgment, we had to begin to allocate proper resources to managing issues. An organization's values and its culture will influence the decision process. For example, I would argue that ethical organizations will consider all aspects of costs and benefits, whereas less ethical organizations only consider profit and loss. Prioritization is the first component of good decision making in issues management. It determines which issues demand the organization's response and therefore the allocation of resources. Although there are a lot of ways to analyze issues using open access and proprietary models, there are four common sense assessments of issues that should guide prioritization. First, what are the consequences and who will have to face the consequences of the issues? Second, how likely is the issue to affect the organization? Third, how much impact will the issue have? No two issues are equal and probably shouldn't be treated as such. Fourth, when there is impact, if it happens, what would occur? In the context of limited resources, sometimes organizations have to balance time scale, severity, and probability. Prioritization is not a decision that's just made once. Issues can be moved up or down on an agenda for action or simply back to continued monitoring depending on the prioritization and the urgency of the issue. Prioritization is often determined by the stakeholders involved as well. Second, organizations must assess their strategic options. Like any other management discipline, robust issues management strategy emerges from sound data, diverse viewpoints, and ingenuity. Credible information and in identifying realistic and measurable objectives provides the foundation for effective anticipatory and responsive strategy development. This is, after all, the core objective of issues management. When an organization is evaluating its options, it has to try and make judgments about the types of scenarios that could happen before they make decisions. This is why issues management is research intensive and information based. However, there's also a creative aspect to this process. Issues management analysts need to be able to take existing information and predict realistic situations that could affect the organization. Building on previous research and anticipatory risk management, the decision-making process in issues management has four components. First, organizations must identify and choose among different risk mitigation options. Second, organizations must identify the opportunity costs associated with risk mitigation. That's to say, if the organization allocates resources to mitigate an issue, are there other unintended consequences, either positive or negative, that might emerge because of risk mitigation. Third, organizations must identify the residual risk that remains even after risk mitigation efforts. Virtually no plan completely eliminates risk and all plans could create other threats. So it's essential that organizations identify the potential side effects to risk mitigation and evaluate those in comparison with the risk itself. And finally, once risk mitigation decisions are taken, who will own the solution development and plan implementation? So who or what department is responsible for executing different elements of the risk mitigation plan? The final component to the decision-making process is actually taking action. It may seem obvious enough, but for anyone who's been around an organization, the space between decisions to take action and taking action can be quite a cavern. According to issues management practitioner expert Tony Jacques, the greatest barriers to effective issues management are the lack of clear objectives and unwillingness or inability to act. For communication practitioners, the action stage should actually look pretty familiar because it feels like a measurable campaign. This means in order to take action effectively, we must first identify clear objectives. Like any measurable objective, they should be concrete. Second, make contingency recommendations. These must be clear and actionable. And third, prioritize risk mitigation actions. We must balance risk and benefit to the actions themselves. The challenge in this process can come in a false economy approach to decision-making. 
If we automatically take the less expensive or easier route, we have to ask the question, is the organization just going to have to make more expensive changes later on? And if so, has the organization opened itself up to additional risks by not taking better or more expensive action? Let me offer you an example. In 2017, the UK witnessed a terrible fire in a high-rise apartment complex, Grenfell Tower. It turned out that the council, in an effort to make the complex look more attractive because it was low-income housing in a very expensive part of London, paid for a cladding or siding to be installed on the outside of the building. The particular cladding they chose was inexpensive but looked nice. The problem was, was that if there was a fire, this cladding could cause catastrophic damage because of how it held the heat in and allowed the fire to spread in the building structure. For example, this particular cladding was already illegal in many countries like the US and Germany. So in 2017, when the worst happened, a fire in the 20 plus story building, many people living on the 14th floor or higher had no ch chance to escape. The loss of life was compounded because the typical recommendations from fire departments and high rise buildings is for people to stay in their apartments because these buildings are meant to be constructed so that fires are easy to contain. Sadly, the cladding made the recommendations deadly. This is a good example of decision making that prioritized short term financial cost against long term risk. A calculated choice would have been made by the council because the risk of the calamity were so low. That is, while the consequences were severe, the probability was low. So in the decision calculus, it could have seemed like a reasonable choice to make. Yet this is precisely the kind of decision calculus that organizations around the world must take and where the answers rely on economics, risk evaluation, and ethics. It should also be clear at this stage that many of the decisions made and actions taken are beyond the remit of public relations and communications professionals. So while issues management often starts with us, it also has to be a cross-functional task to ensure that the right people are making the decisions. So while the particular actions that an organization takes may not be directly related to communication, we should be part of the process because whether the communication strategy is internally internal or external, or most likely a combination of both, we are nearly always a part of the action stage and often involved throughout the decision-making process.